Crossovers are everywhere and you're using them every time you use a speaker. If you're running subs and tops, you probably know that you need a crossover. You might even have a crossover, but you're just not sure how to set it up. But they come in many forms, not just the box that you're picturing in the rack next to your PA. So in this video, you'll learn what crossovers are and why we use them. You'll learn the difference between an active and a passive crossover, why that matters, as well as a type of crossover that isn't actually a piece of equipment at all. Finally, we'll talk about best practices for setting them up and why those best practices are best practices. It's going to get a little bit complicated, but by the end of this video, you should have a better understanding of crossovers in general and what that word even means. If I've not met yet, then I'm Andrew and I mix live shows for a living. If you're going to set up a PA system, you'll probably benefit from measuring and tuning that PA system. And that's a lot easier with my PA checkpoint chart, which I'll leave in the description down below. For now, let's dive in. Okay, so what are crossovers and why do we use them, right? A crossover is basically just like an EQ, right? It's a filter that we apply to the signals which are going to our speakers so that we can separate them into different frequency bands, right? What I mean by that is that we can cut the base out of the signal and send that just to a subwoofer and we can cut the top out of a signal and we'll send that just to the tops. Now, if you think about how you would do this, if you just sat there looking at your EQ, what tools do you have? You've got things like your low cut filter, what does the low cut filter do? It cuts the bass out of a signal, doesn't it? And you move that up, determining how much bass you wanna cut out your signal. What's left after you cut all the bass out of the signal? Why, it's everything else. So if you cut all of the bass out of a signal using a filter, everything you've got left is what you probably want to send to the tops, isn't it? On the flip side, you find a low pass filter, a high cut filter, and we bring that down the way to cut all of the top all of the high frequencies out of a signal. So when you bring that down to a certain point, then all you have left is the base frequencies. That's the kind of stuff that you want to send to your subs. All a crossover is then, is it's a pair of filters and you pick a frequency point where those two filters meet. So it's kind of like if you say that your crossover is 100 hertz, you took your high pass filter and you put it up the way until 100 hertz. So you cut out all the low between zero and 100 hertz. And you also took your low pass filter your high cut filter, and you brought that down again to 100 hertz. Both of the filters are meeting at 100 hertz, so the two pieces of the sound are cut at 100 hertz. One piece has all the information below, one piece has all the information above. The point of a crossover filter is that it does this precisely at that point, and it is designed so that when you recombine that signal, it recombines fully. When you add the low part, to the high part again, you end up with a full frequency spectrum. And so that's what we do in a speaker system. We cut the lows out and we send them to the low speakers, the subs, and we cut the highs out and we send them to the high speakers, the tops, and then we play both those sounds together at the same time and they recombine in the air. So what our ears hear is the full spectrum of sound. But why do we do that? Each part of the audio system, right, each speaker in our PA system is a specialist. That sub is designed to reproduce just bass frequencies. Similarly, our tops are designed to produce all the frequencies above the low, low sub, but not the sub frequencies. By using a crossover, we're making sure that we're not sending unnecessary frequencies to a speaker. We're not telling a speaker to reproduce sounds that it is not optimally designed to do. So we need a crossover for clearer audio, and we also need a crossover for more headroom, because the amount of energy that we would expend trying to get the sub to produce those high frequencies isn't worth it. We're gonna lose efficiency. We won't have the same volume, and we won't have clean volume. If you're enjoying this video and it's useful so far, I'd love it if you could subscribe to the channel down below. I've got loads more videos on PA systems. So what happens if we do end up sending those bass frequencies to our tops, to our tweeters? What we're going to end up with is we're going to end up with these small high frequency drivers designed to reproduce high frequencies, trying to reproduce the low frequencies. The problem that happens there is that low frequencies take up a lot of space and they require a lot of energy. They require a lot of air to move to reproduce them. So we are trying to get this tiny little diaphragm to move a huge amount of air, right? It's a lot of excursion back and forward for the diaphragm itself. And we can end up over excursing, is that a word? Over extending the diaphragm and damaging it, right? Distortion, we end up with distorted audio if we try and get the high frequency driver to reproduce the sub frequencies. 
On the other side, right, we've got this big speaker that is designed to reproduce the bass frequencies. It's designed to move the air and reproduce those bigger wavelengths. While the high frequency driver is designed to move quickly and reproduce the shorter wavelengths, the fast frequencies in the high frequencies. So if we ask the sub then to reproduce those high frequencies, it's going to try and move this large diaphragm, this large speaker cone far too fast. It could end up overheating, we could damage the speaker, or it could just sound like distortion, sound really, really unclear. So hopefully that clears up what a crossover is and why you need to use one. But it gets more complicated than that, because as I said at the start of the video, crossovers are found in every single speaker that we come across, not just in the crossover unit that you buy and connect up in your speaker system, right? And there's two types of crossovers that we come across in this form. We've got passive crossovers and active crossovers. So what is a passive crossover? A passive crossover is made up of electronic components that sit inside the speaker enclosure itself, right? Like resistors, capacitors, that sort of thing. I'm not an electrician, so I'm mostly just naming electrical components here, but a passive crossover exists in the signal pathway inside a speaker. Why does it exist there? Think about your speaker, like any old speaker. I should show you my studio monitors that's sitting right here, right? But like, they've got a tweeter and they've got a woofer, right? Any kind of standard top. The same problem exists between the tweeter and the woofer as exists between the subs and the tops. There are components designed to recreate a specific frequency range. But you don't often think about using a crossover to make your tops function normally, do you? That's because there's a passive crossover inside the speaker enclosure. So what we do is we amplify up our channel or maybe it's a powered speaker. We send the audio into the speaker and then we call it done. But inside the speaker, these electrical components split the audio and they send only the portion of the signal that is necessary to the tweeter and only the portion that's necessary to the woofer, right? So each individual component in our speaker system is performing optimally. The flip side to this is the active crossover. If we have an active crossover, right, we have an external piece of hardware which is splitting the signal up. So I would wager that most of the crossovers that you're thinking about are active crossovers. They're external crossovers outside of the speaker enclosure. It gets a little more complicated though, because actually the electronics inside the speaker itself might be active. The word active in this sense just means that the piece of electronics, which is cutting the frequency spectrum up is powered and is an electronic circuit which is turned on as opposed to being like a passive component like a resistor. So if most speakers have passive crossovers built into them already, again, why do we care? Why do we need an active crossover, separate piece of hardware to do the crossing over? Well, it's inefficient, right? As we send the signal into the speaker and it runs through the passive crossover, the crossover heats up, right? There is an amount of energy which is dissipated in that crossover in the form of heat. That's inefficiency. That's energy that is not moving the speaker cone and not providing us fidelity in our listening experience. We go one level higher though, right? Because you're thinking, okay, we've got a crossover for the sub, we've got a crossover for the top, but the tops then have their own passive crossover inside the enclosure. But you can bypass that and you can actually split the signal up three ways instead of two ways. And now you have a signal which goes for the sub, a signal which goes for the mid range driver in the top, and a signal which goes to the tweeter in the top. Now, if we're using a passive PA system with separate amplifiers, there's a nice big benefit that we get here. If we are amplifying each section of the frequency range, so the lows, the mids, the highs, we're amplifying them all separately. The fact that we are amplifying them all separately means that each amplifier can work more efficiently because it's only working on the frequency range that it's supposed to be amplifying. It also means that there is less heat loss in the components of the speaker. The recombined sound that we hear once all three components combine in the air is going to be higher fidelity, higher quality, less distortion, more headroom, more volume. I hope that one makes sense. Let's turn the difficulty up one more time. Right? I talked in the start about how you might find a crossover which isn't actually even a piece of hardware. Right? These pieces of hardware that we are using to split up the frequency spectrum, they are called electronic crossovers. And the counterpart to the electronic crossover is the acoustic crossover. So the electronic crossover is the piece of equipment that we use to split up the frequency spectrum. Right? And it all happens in the electronic domain, right? It's an electrical signal or maybe a digital signal which is running through a piece of equipment and that piece of equipment is saying, yep, I'm gonna chop this here, at, call it 100 hertz. 
I'm going to chop this one here at 100 hertz, and then they should recombine together perfectly, shouldn't they? We add both the signals back together, and they should recombine. But there is a variable at play here, which that crossover cannot know about, and that is the actual speaker and the room, right? So what happens is that the speakers reproduce the sounds, tops produce the top, subs the sub, and then that sound recombines in the air. The point that it recombines in the air, the point in physical space, that is also a crossover, right? That is where the two waveforms, the two sounds, meet each other and our ears experience the full frequency spectrum again. Stay with me here. In an ideal world, when we played those two sounds, the lows and the highs, out of their speakers, and then they recombined in the room, we experienced them in our ears, they would both recombine at the same point that we set the crossover. Let's call it 100 hertz, and everything would be wonderful. But how we experience the recombination of those sounds is affected by how loud both of those sounds are. Let me open up a graph and show you real quickly. So let's look at a graph of this, right? And hopefully you follow along here. If not, it's okay. I've got a video where I explain some of these graphs and things. I'll leave a link to that in the description down below. In this graph, this kind of teal colored line here is the sub, right? So you can see here the frequency range down the bottom. So at 125 Hertz, the sub drops off. That makes sense. The pink line is the top. And you can see that, you know, it kind of slowly tapers off below 125, but it's not filtered yet. The acoustic crossover is the point where both of these signals are at the same volume. It's the frequency where both of these signals are at the same volume. So if I look at this graph, right, I just find where they cross over. And so they're both at plus 3 dB at about 125 hertz. That means that the crossover, the acoustic crossover, is at 125 hertz. But think about this. What if I turn the subs up? I've turned the subs up a bunch of dBs now, right? And you can see that the point where these lines cross over is no longer the same, right? It's shifted very, very slightly. Now, the point where they cross over is just a little bit above 125 hertz. So not, not a huge deal, right? I'll move this back down to where it was. Look at this now. Let's say that I move it even lower. Now, where did the crossover go? Now the crossover is down at, what's that, 87 hertz, right? And it could be that the crossover filter that we selected, that we picked before we set these speakers up and played them, it could be that it was set at 100 hertz. But the actual place in the frequency spectrum where the two sounds meet at our ears at the same volume, that, the acoustic crossover, that changes based on the volume. Now, if you're not setting up the PA systems, maybe this isn't hugely important information to you, but I hope that it's useful for you to know. If there's one thing I want you to take away from the acoustic crossover section of this, it's that we don't set the acoustic crossover. We measure the acoustic crossover. We can set our electronic crossover, that is how we filter the signals, but the result of that, the acoustic crossover, is something that we need to measure with a microphone. I'll leave a link to a video that shows you how to do that. But let's talk about the common kind of crossover setups, how they might look. The one that you're probably thinking of is your basic sort of crossover unit by like Behringer or DBX or something like that, right? And it's gonna have an input for left and an input for right. And each input is going to have two outputs. When you plug in your left signal, the two outputs will be top and sub. And you just take the output of your top and you send that to the amplifier, which is then connected to your top speakers. And you take the output that says sub, connect that to your amplifier, which is feeding your sub speakers. Or if you're using powered speakers, you would just go out of that crossover unit straight into the speakers. So top would go to top, it might say high frequency, and sub would go to the subs, it might say low frequency. Usually on the front, there is a dial which allows you to pick the crossover frequency. That's the point where you're going to cut. But other than that, there aren't a lot of controls. You can't choose the intensity of the cut, like how steep the curve is when you cut those frequencies. What you can do is you can read the manual for your speakers and find the recommended crossover frequency set by the manufacturer. And if that doesn't exist in the manual, then you should get in touch with the manufacturer and ask them what frequency they expect you to cross those speakers over at, because they're probably already pre-designed. Another form of crossover that you'll come across is actually just a DSP unit or a loudspeaker processor. And this isn't as straightforward as like, you know, plug in left, right, and plug out high and low. This will usually have a few inputs and multiple outputs. And what you do is you connect your left, right into the loudspeaker processor, the DSP, 
and then in the DSP, you'll be able to pick which output corresponds to which speakers. So one for top, two for sub, three for front fills, four for delays, something like that. And then on each individual output, you will be able to pick the frequency that you want the crossover to start at, and also the slope, how intense you want it to be. It's quite advanced stuff. Again, you probably should read Bob McCarthy's book if you're going to start playing around with this stuff. Alternatively, if you're using a speaker system which has a processor, like a Meyer Sound system and a Meyer Sound processor, there will be existing presets that you can load onto the channels of that speaker processor that set the crossover so that it suits the speaker system that you're using. Finally, linked to that one step on is of course DSP amplifiers. If you're using a passive system with a DSP amplifier, again, you just plug your left right into channels one and two of the amplifier, you get your laptop out, you connect up to your DSP amplifier or you use the panel on the front and you select the speaker presets. That is you tell the amplifier, okay, I'm connecting a, you know, Y7P speaker to channel one of this amplifier and I'm connecting a B6 sub to channel two of this amplifier and the amplifier goes, cool, I know how to set the settings and set the crossover to make these speakers work correctly. Finally, a lot of powered speakers have built-in DSP and built-in crossovers. If you use like the TurboSound IQ range, is it that what it's called? Uh, QSC speakers, things like that. You'll notice that on the dials on the back, you can pick what speakers you're using together. You can say, I'm using an I12 speaker with an, I can't remember what they're called, I6 sub or something like that. And it's just going to automatically set the crossover, set the filter frequencies on those speakers so that you get the most out of them. Again, this comes back to the manufacturer thing. It's the manufacturer that chooses the crossover frequency for the components in their speaker. Very unlikely to be you. So I hope that was helpful. Leave a comment down below and let me know what the crossover is in your system. I'll leave a video up here which is about tuning speaker systems and that should give you a bit more info about the acoustic crossover situation there.